Well, good evening. Welcome back to the Throttle Up Biker Bible Study. Glad you guys are here. And as always, we're glad you guys are out there on the internet watching. Uh, keep sharing. Keep uh, uh, telling your friends about us. We really appreciate it. Uh, but we welcome you in and pray that um, you find that here we teach the truth about what the Bible actually says. <coughs> Again, this week I heard people arguing about, about this or about that. And just read it. You know, to spend time, you'll understand it. But uh, we try to teach the truth of the way the Bible is in an easy way to understand, even if the concepts are difficult. And some of the concepts that we go through are very difficult. But regardless, um, we're here back in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 3 again today, plugging away. Last week we, we got through the first six verses of chapter 3. It's, Pretty heavy chapter. Uh, the verses tonight are, are pretty heavy as well, but I think we should be able to finish the chapter tonight. At least that's the, that's the goal, at least, uh, to finish the chapter. But regardless, we'll go as far as we can and we'll let the Holy Spirit lead us. How about that? Is that good enough? Amen. All right. I don't have very, very many announcements uh, this week. There's a lot of things going on, like the Strawberry Festival down in Dayton. Um, toward the end of the month, there is the... Uh, Hog Rally that is sponsored by Smoky Mountain Harley Davidson out in Maryville. Uh, a few other things, but uh, what we're all excited about here is the open house Saturday, June 2nd. It's coming up quick. That's three weeks. Three weeks. Free. So just be ready for that. We got Bikers for Christ out of Pikeville coming down to do bike blessings. We got food we're going to have. It's going to be a good time. So come on out and, and hang out with us for a while. Uh, as I stated, we have permission from the liquor store down the corner to put a, a sign up for our church. Uh, the look on his face when I was asking him for permission was, a church wants to put a sign in my, in my driveway? I said, yeah, I do. So that was interesting. He said yes, so I'll be putting a sign up hopefully tomorrow. I didn't get it out last weekend, but I'll try tomorrow. I'll get it up for this weekend. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where we have to focus and... and uh, and get things done. Uh, if you notice, we're kind of squeezed back into the, the old room now because we got all the ceiling done in this room and we'll be working in that room tomorrow, finishing the ceiling, finishing the sheetrock, and we'll be cleaning out the office and doing all the sheetrock in there. So a lot of stuff going on, but we're getting closer, ever closer to that, that grand opening. Anyway, but let me go ahead and pray for us and we'll, we'll jump back into study, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord God, again, I thank you for another beautiful day that you've given us, Lord, with the birds singing and the sun shining. Father God, we just thank you for the words that are written in this book, Lord, that we can learn more about you and more about the sun that you have that is now shining on us. Father God, just uh, open our ears, open our hearts, Lord, clear our minds as we learn what the writer of Hebrews was trying to tell us, Lord, as, as we compare Jesus back to Moses and how important it is that we understand uh, why the transition uh, was made to where we worship Him now instead of following the law. Father God, I thank you for those that are here and those who are watching on the internet. Lord, just keep them coming. Not for my benefit, Lord, but for theirs. Not for my glory, but for yours. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so here we go. We're going to start in verse 7. And... Hello, Did you go to sleep? Oh. Windows decided to give me a message. Hang on a second. Update. Three hours later. You got to turn it on, right? No, it was on. Windows told me it's time to update. So. That was a good deal. It was a good deal. All right, so here we are in verse 7. It says, therefore, now, of course you know, whenever we see that word, we have to know what the therefore is there for. So, with everything that he's mentioned before, keep that in mind as we say the following. As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of the testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Hmm. 
Therefore, again, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Wow. Now, I wrote all those together because that is Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. So the writer of Hebrews obviously knows his Old Testament, knows the Psalms. So let me read what 7 through 11 actually says. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Then it starts with this. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof that they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. See, the people of Israel had been in bondage, in captivity in Egypt for over 400 years. And God led them out of that bondage, out of that servanthood. And they watched the miracles happen. They knew that it was the Lord their God that led them out. But as soon as they got out, their hearts started to wander. Their minds started to sway. When Moses went up on the mountain to receive the word of God, and he came back down, they had built their own little golden idols again. They had started falling back into their old ways. That's when God said, they always go astray in their heart. Therefore I swore, they shall not enter my rest. So now, if you actually look at a map from Egypt up to, up to Israel, up to Jerusalem where the, the capital city is, is, it's not that far. And yet it took them 40 years. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Because God caused them to lose their way. Fed them, protected them, but caused them to wonder. And here's why it took 40 years. I swore in my wrath, they. That means the entire generation. Yep. Now, I'm not sure about this part, but I think if you go back and read in Exodus, one of the last ones to die is Moses. Because Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land. But... The, the people of Israel have been let out of Egypt by, the, by Moses through the commandment of God. And like I say, when he went up on the mountain, they started falling back into their other ways. But remember who the writer's talking to here. These are recently converted Jews to Christianity. And they are warning them not to do the same thing. Don't fall back into your old ways. See, some of them are already starting to turn away. To, to go back to their old ways and not keeping the words of Christ in them. Some of them had already mixed some of the Judaism with Christianity. Uh, some of them had gone back into their um, other false teachings and things like that. But the writer is saying, look, not again, people. We did this once before. Uh, and look at, at what it cost those that did not stay on the path. Even Moses did not enter the promised land. He did not enter the rest. That's what God's calling the rest there. That's, that's the promised land that He gave them. If those who followed Moses were responsible to surrender, to trust, and preserve in following God's leader... How much more are we responsible to do the same thing with a greater leader, Jesus? Right? right. He, he fulfilled the law. We don't have to worry about all that stuff anymore. Praise God. But 
We're getting so lax in what we're doing. Listen to this. As in the rebellion in the day of the trial. Now, the day of the trial refers to the, to the first trial at Meribah. That's out of Numbers 20. Where Miriam had died and there was no water. And the people rose up against Moses and Aaron. And said they would have been better off staying in Egypt. Oh, you'd rather be a slave and have food and water instead of trusting God and having more than you could ever want. See, they would have been better off in Egypt because at least they had food and water. But more generally, it speaks of Israel's refusal to trust and enter the promised land during the Exodus because of the false reports of who was there. Remember they sent spies ahead and the spies came back terrified of the giants that ate people? <laughs> Where? No, they just wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back to what they had. God did not accept their unbelief and He did condemn the generation for the unbelief to die in the wilderness. That's in Numbers 14. God's anger was kindled against this generation on account of their unbelief as well. They refused to trust God for the great things He had promised and were unwilling to persist in the truth and in the trust that they were to have in Him. The writer does not want this to happen again to those who have changed from the law to the belief in Christ. Don't, don't go back to what we had before. It's not going to get us anywhere. We have to move forward. Mm -hmm. The Messiah has come. We have to put our trust in Him. Remember I said the first couple of chapters he spent talking about the who of Christ. Who is He? He is the Son of God. Who, who is He? He is the one that has been prophesied about. Who is it that we have to watch for? The Messiah. He has come. Amen. Now it's switching to the what. What has He done? So it's going from... Who fulfilled the law to how or what did he do to fulfill the law? So let's go on into now to verse 12 and we'll, we'll look at the next part of this. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, an unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Now this is a good one here. This is it. See, there are many ways to look at this, but here is, here's what we're going to go on for now. See, this is where we're going to focus. What is our commandment from Jesus? What was the last commandment He gave us? Love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And? Uh, don't worship any other gods. Well, that's part of the, the first two. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right, listen to this. So we're to love our neighbor as ourself. And we are to go. Right? Into every nation. Preaching the gospel. <clears throat> right? Listen to this. To go out and preach the gospel and bring others to Him. And if we fall away from God, if, if we do not do what He has told us to do, what does that do to those who need to hear from us the gospel of Christ? That takes away one of their avenues to hear about Him. That's right. Now, Far be it for me to say, if God says that this person needs to hear from somebody, somebody won't get to them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, it's supposed to be us that gets it to them. It's going to come back and play an important part in a minute. So, if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen regardless. You know, He'll bring somebody from around the world to make it happen. But, it is our responsibility to do that as well. But if we fall away from God, if we do not do what He's told us to do, what does that do from, to those? So if God has it slated for us to be the ones to teach a specific person or a specific group or nation, and we don't do it, then we have let them down, and they may not hear about Him from anyone for a while. What does it do? What's the ripple effect? What, what happens when we don't show God to others? 
right? See, see what is what is worse here, you know, is that by our actions are or non-actions in this case, uh, we can cause others to stumble as well as keep them from the full life of being a Christian. If we fall away from God, yeah. then they see us and they say, well, what is such a big deal about being a Christian? Look at this guy. He's not living like he says he's supposed to. Hypocrite. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I have to, dunk, to debunk all of the time is how can you Christians be happy when you can't do anything? Well, that's, that can't be farther from the truth. That's right. You know? Um, I, what, what they mean, I think, is, is that they think we cannot have a good time or a good life if we're not out drinking and having a party. Mm -hmm. False. That's false. That is absolutely false. I tell you, you know, I, I did enough for more than any ten people, but I was still not happy even then. That's right. I thought I was happy because that's what people told me I was. Mm -hmm. And I was not happy until I got my life back in tune with what Christ wanted from me. Now I'm extremely happy. I don't have to go out and do all that stuff that I used to, I, you know, I, I don't care if somebody else does it, that's, but that's not for me anymore. So I'm extremely happy even though I don't want to do that anymore. Doesn't mean I can't. I'm just saying I won't do that anymore. Yes, sir. You will never have peace and happiness unless you have a relationship with Jesus. There will be times when everything is going so, oh, this is so wonderful, I'm having a great time, and you go home and they say, it's all over. Yeah. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't gain anything. Why was, what was the purpose? Without a relationship with Jesus, you never have peace and happiness. Right. That's absolutely right, Dave. See, Now that I'm back living that life that Christ has put in front of me, I'm a much happier person, and I don't miss those old days at all. So this verse speaks directly to me, because the farther I got away from God, the worse I got. But the truth is, God was never far away from me. When I realized that and I hit my knees and I said, I'm sorry for the way I'm living. And he said he would never leave me or forsake me and that all was forgiven. That day changed my life. Me too. Amen. Completely changed my life. I didn't Amen. have a want or desire for any of that anymore. He told me to stop trying to live as others wanted me to live and live the way that he told me to live. I, I'll, I'll never forget the, the feeling that I got when and I went up front to the altar there at that church. And the, uh, one of the twins, I can't remember which one's which, but he came up and said, what is it, brother? What's, what's on your mind? And I said, God's telling me to stop living like other people tell me to. He said, then what are you supposed to do? I said, I'm supposed to live like he told me to. And he told me, just do it. Just do that. Wow. I felt so much better after that. Now, lost a lot of friends. Lost a lot of family. <laughs> they weren't really friends. But they were not interested in me in not living that lifestyle. They weren't really friends. Right. If you want to learn about church, go into any bar, and they will tell you about it's filled with hypocrites, they're only after your money, you have to dress a certain way, you can't do this, you can't drink, you can't smoke, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And none of that is true. None of that is true, in, in, at least in our case. Now, there are some places that do put priorities on things, Yes, there are. but that's not us. Right. So. Like I say, that caused a lot of people to walk away from me, but that is their issue to bear, not mine. Me too. One can truly believe God 
yet be occasionally troubled by doubts. And there is a doubt that wants God's promises, but is weak in faith at that moment. Unbelief isn't weakness of faith. It sets itself in opposition to faith. It is the opposite of faith. Now listen to what Spurgeon says. He says, The great sin of not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is often spoken of very lightly and in a very trifling spirit, as though it were scarcely any sin at all. Yet, according to his text, Spurgeon's, he's talking about the Bible, and indeed according to the whole tenor of the Scriptures, unbelief is the giving of God the lie what could be worse? And what he means by that is you can't go by what others tell you. You have to know for yourself the truth in the Scriptures. You have to. Thirteen, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Okay, another good one. It says, exhort one another. That means build each other up. It means encourage each other. Do not discourage anyone. And do not be discouraged every day. Now, that word today there, in the King James, is two separate words. T-O space D-A-Y. And I didn't know why there would be such a difference in that word. So I went back to the Greek, you know, as I do. And the Greek there is sermion. Sermion. Which is the word today. So I still don't know why the King James has it as two separate words. But it doesn't matter. It is today. Now, here's the key about what it is in that sentence. That word is not talking about Thursday. It is talking about the time of the age, or the time of the church, where the time of the law, we could technically say was yesterday, and the time of the church is today, and the time of the Lord coming back is tomorrow. But that word today is the time of the church age. See, there was a time for the law, but it is now gone. It is time for the church, which is the realization of what Christ has done for us and what He is in our hearts. Remember what we, we said this even Sunday, Brother Will preached on it, said, where is the church? It's not this building. It's not First Baptist downtown. It's, it's, it's not the uh, uh, Church of God of Harriman. Courts of, praise. Uh, courts of Praise. It's not. It's our hearts. It is our hearts. This is the, this is the church. Right, we are the temple. Sorry, this is the temple. We are the church. We are the church. But sorry, couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I tried, but it's too late. But it's our hearts. So we have to have our hearts right with Him today. To do that, we hold each other up, hold each other accountable, but encourage each other. Now, what happens after this age? Or, or better, what is to come in the next age? You say that with a, a, a passionate... Yeah, he's coming back. Yeah, when he comes back, absolutely. Now, there, there's a tribulation time in there. Some people say we've already started it. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I think those days are going to be really nasty. Um, but when he comes back, it's going to be nice. But listen to this. See, it, it will not matter then because if we have done what we were supposed to do and believed in Him as our Savior, we will be with Him and not have to do anything other than worship and exalt Him every day. That's what will happen in that time. Now, what is coming does matter in the last part of the line. 
that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You've heard of the unpardonable sin. What is it? Against the Holy Spirit. Blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Very good. It's exactly what I've heard down here. I love that when y'all have the right answer. Anyway, it's, it's uh, the denouncement or denial of the Holy Spirit in the last days. Now, I believe that is only possible in the last days. Okay? That's, that's just what I believe. But even if, it, even if it's possible today, if you, if you think about someone who denounces Christ now, then they're not going to heaven because they will not be saved. But in that end time, a person can denounce God and be removed, I believe. But anyway, so, but if we continue to meet and build one another up, this will not be possible. The other side of this is we cannot tear each other down as that will lead to deceitfulness of sin to enter and bring both us and the ones that are engaging in the act of arguing over things that does not matter to salvation. We can't, going back a few verses, actually back into, into uh, Romans, we, we can cause a brother to stumble by arguing over things that don't matter. We can keep people out of church because they look and say, those guys can't get their act together. They can't agree. Why do I want to be part of that? Uh, we can't do that. We cannot do that. This is one of the biggest problems in the churches today. And I use that word churches in a very scarce tone there. How conceited they are in specific beliefs and the thought that if someone... disagrees with with the way they believe they're not Christians. There's a lot of that. Yeah. You know, uh, one of my one of my pet peeves, and one of the things we talk about in here quite often, I, I bring it up simply because I saw it again today, and it really it really upset me the way this guy was saying it today. There are people out there that say you have to read the King James; nothing else matters. Exactly. Right. That's not right. That's not true. That's not true. Now. Are there problems or, or things missing in the NIV? Yes. Are there things that have been changed even in the ESV? Yes. But what do I do? I always go back to the King James in case there's something different. But where do I go to get the final answer? That's back to the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic. So the people that make the comment, King James only, I look at them and I, and I want to read what's on the wall over there. Alf, death, you know, just read those, those first four characters on the wall over there and say, if you can't read that, then you shouldn't be reading the, reading the King James. You know what that says? It says, in the beginning. Wow. In the beginning was not King James. In the beginning was God. Amen. All right? Now, is the King James closer than other things? Okay. But there are people that can't read the King's English, that can't read the these and thous, and it really is confusing. So I would rather someone take a Bible that they can read and then come ask questions, and we show them, than to get a King James, get frustrated, and throw it down, and never read it again. See, you know, who, who authorized the King James? King James. King mm -hmm. James. And he gave him a certain amount of time. Am I wrong here? To, to put this out, they, they couldn't do it, so they went ahead and copied. That's right. They inserted another so set what of books. Was the name of that? Um, Genesis, not Genesis. Uh, oh boy, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, they actually took word for word to fill it, to the get it in, yeah. so they could put it out to satisfy the king. Mm -hmm. Okay? King James is not the original English version of the Bible. Yeah. It's been translated 110 times. Yeah. Well, the English. The English part of it, yeah. So, so I understand these people that say Geneva. You can't you, you can't use Geneva these other Bible. You can't Bible. use these other versions because <laughs> they changed the doctrine. 
okay, you know what? If as long as they get Jesus as the Messiah and he died on the cross and arose three days later for the blood atonement of our sins, and the rest of it I just said doesn't matter. It doesn't. And that's hardening of the... Ah, very good. Somebody connected my dots for me. That's exactly right, Gene. Because that's exactly what that's talking about. That is exactly what that's talking about. See, what is required to be saved? What is required of us to be saved? Really, accept for Jesus, accept Him. Uh, just accept of your sin. In, from your heart. Yep, that's it. He said to the thief on the cross, Believe in me and you'll be with me in heaven tonight. On this day, you'll be with me. That's it. Oh, we're done. Yeah, everything he did and the other thief did, one accepted him and one, one didn't. Did. One's in heaven. One. Yeah, and the other one's skipping stones and fire. So, anyway. I so, I'm sorry? I have something I'd add. There's a study called Hermeneutics. Yes. And it is taking something from one culture and applying it or understanding it in another culture. And the King James 2,000 years ago, when they said, fear God, they were talking about the very highest respect so far above anybody else. The word fear today, if you fear God, you think he's going to beat you with a stick. And that's only one of the things that Hermeneutics yeah. shows us in the King James. Yep. Alright, so the acceptance of what he was done on the cross, and that's where we need to keep our focus. That's why we say that here. If there's denominationally different ideas and concepts, they stay outside. We don't care. We're focused on the cross. That's it. Anything that happens afterwards, that's totally up to the denomination you belong to. We don't we don't hey, deal can with I that. say one more thing? Please. Just while I'm thinking about the Holy Spirit telling me about this thing. It says, okay, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if you know your true purpose in the Lord and everything, you will not be hardened. So you don't have to worry about the flesh. You're following what God tells you to do, just as, do that. As long as you follow it, right? Exactly. Right. But exhort one another every day. That's why... That's why the, the body it, is. Even though we don't always agree right. on other things that don't matter, every That's day you call me... Stuff. I, I, I do my best to encourage you mm -hmm. with your ministry, with whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. because you are my brother in Christ. Yes. Because we both believe that Jesus died for our sins on that cross. Yep. And we are doing our best from what he's telling us through the Holy Spirit to go and do. Somebody's the hand, somebody's the arm, somebody's the leg, somebody's the feet, somebody's the head. Yeah, I think I'm God, the bottom of the Jesus feet because I stink. Anyway, what's that? I'm the elbow. You're the elbow? <laughs> What is that? What is that old wrestling move? The power elf, uh, atomic drop. What was it? He said the loose skin. Oh, the chicken skin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna embarrass my daughter. When Liberty was little, I'd run around. I grabbed that little piece of skin, called her chicken skin, and she'd just yell at me. Stop it! Anyway, so look, we need to keep our focus on the cross. Not on anything else. We cannot work hard enough or do enough to save ourselves. All of us agree with that, all right? Amen. All right. So it is only what He did for us that saves us, the gift that comes from God through Jesus. The writer is reminding them that is true, but to not fall back into former practices or fall away from God because it would bring others down as well. And that would s slow or diminish the furthering of the kingdom of God. If someone is watching me going, I'm watching that Christian. I'm going to see what he does. And I do something that is not what is of God. Then that's going to cause them to not want to be like Christ. Is that making sense so far? Mm -hmm. How many Ooh. times have you done that? Have you done something and realized you didn't and have to go back to the person you've done in front of and apologize to them? Yep. And tell them that that's not the way the Christian is supposed to act. 14. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. 
to the end not only of our lives, but to the end of the age of the church. The literal end of time. See, faithfulness is a community project. We were just talking about the different body parts, right? So, <laughs> so, so God put us all together to help one another. Otherwise, why would you and I be together as partners in this silly notion of building a biker church? Uh, well, because we are both bikers and we both love Christ. Well, that's the, and that's the simple answer, but the, the real answer is because He put us together. We are to encourage one another in the faith so that no one drifts away. I think there's a reason for this. We need one another. Satan doesn't necessarily come wearing his red suit with his pitchfork and a bunch of ears. Yep. He comes in so many small ways. You find him on TV, on the internet, you find him in magazines. A little, 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 trying to get you convinced. And unless you have someone to talk to, someone who knows the Lord, and discuss it with you, Yep. He'll, and you'll fall into that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good point, David. Good point. So, we are to encourage one another in the faith. Our priority is not a style of music, uh, which day we worship on, or a particular tradition. Right. Which Bible we read. Which Bible we read. Good point. Our priority is Christ, and we need to help each other remember that so that no one will become tired of hearing about the one who died for us. I don't care how many times I read the Bible, I get something new out of it every time. Yep. Okay. I can read the same verse three times in a row and different words will pop out every time. Yep. Sometimes depending on your, your situation, your circumstances that you're dealing with right then and there, you can read the same verse and get something different out of it. And it's the living word. You do, he does, and he will help you out of that situation just by his word. Yep. The living word. I like the way you said that because that is, it's, it is. It's living. It's active. What I found over the years is I need to hear somebody else read a verse to me that I've read a read hundred times because they'll put the inflection right. on a different part of the sentence. Um, I'm trying to remember how we used to say it in school. Um, I can't remember the first word, but we, we emphasized a different syllable. You know? And that just changes the whole word you just heard. I said the word syllable, but that's not what you heard. You heard syllable. So, anyway. It's true. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. We often say our hearts have been hardened by others or by the circumstances that we've been involved in. Right. But the fact is that we harden our own hearts in response to what may have been done to us. Now, this also could be read, do not allow yourself to harden your heart, but we know in the Bible that God hardens hearts as well. He did the Pharaoh and he did Yeah, okay. But, so don't get the two confused. This is... This is not God doing it. This is you doing it. So, our faithfulness will show that we are now sharing in Christ. So, we hold on tight and we help others hold on tight. Uh, We do that by meeting together and worshiping together. Always fixing our thoughts on Jesus. For as it is said, verse 15 tells us, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Even today, some people harden their hearts and resist the changes that Christ wants to bring in their lives. Well, I I could do that, but I I really just want to do this first. I'll change tomorrow. Let me go ahead and go finish what I'm doing now. No, you need to change now. There may not be a tomorrow. There may not be a a, a 9 o'clock tonight. We don't know. That's right. Whether that's a squirrel or a 
landfall on the, on the stuff we give you. Well, you can also uh, harden your heart too whenever you don't act when God puts it on your heart to do something. Yep. And you put it off, and the next time He puts it on your heart to do something, you put it off. You get to a point where you keep putting God off, and you, you just pull yourself further away from God by not acting when uh, when God puts it on your heart to do something. You get used to not doing it instead of feeling the reward or the, 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 the peace for doing it. I'm going to ask you one of my favorite questions. What does God need from you? Can you say that again? Nothing. God needs nothing from you, but what does God want from you? Love. Love. Worship. I, I, yep, keep going. Obedience. Obedience. Everything. Everything. He needs Submit. nothing. He wants everything. everything. A relationship. See that? See the difference? Mm -hmm. He need. He doesn't need you at all. No, that's right. He created you. He brought you into this world. He can take you out of this world. That's right. But he would rather have all of you. I have a, now. Maybe this is not the time to bring stuff because this is being recorded. But I can always. Edit I it think. Out. I, I. I don't know. I, I think that in a way he created us for us to need Him, but also He uses our flesh because He's a spirit, God is a spirit, right? And we love and all that. And we're, we're flesh. And in order for me to communicate with you because I'm flesh, He uses us so He kind of like needs us to submit to Him. Am I wrong about that? I understand you know, what you're saying. He's trying, he's trying me to relate something to you. Mm -hmm. and he gives it to me to give to you. Right, because so he, wants, he wants you to submit to him so that you can do it. Does he need you to do that? No, no. you don't. He'll get someone else to do it. I mean, he's got to all worked out. He's talked to plenty directly. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got something to say about that here in a minute. Ooh, listen to this. <laughs> See, today if we hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, even though some people do it. So, I ask, what it is that Christ wants from you, and He wants everything, and He wants to bring into your life the things that He's promised. So the answer now, as it was then, is to fix our thoughts on Jesus so that we hear what He is saying and to encourage one another. Right? That's what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. But we must change the ways of our lives and be still and listen for that small voice to guide us. When you guys were out of town, I, I, I preached on uh, uh, listening to the small, still voice, you know? And this is what I was thinking of. Um, I laugh at Joy Mayer from The View. When she talks about Pres uh, Vice President Pence, uh, she made fun of him yeah. for saying that he listened to that small voice. Well, I tell you, if you spend time in the Word and spend quality time, quiet time with Him, you will definitely hear from Him through the Holy Spirit. And we do miss out on that daily on what He says because we have hardened our hearts to things. Yes, sir. That's one of the things I pray about twice a day because I know God is leading me. The problem isn't him leading me, the problem is in my listening and understanding what the Holy Spirit is saying. And this is what I ask for. Help me to understand, Father, to be your servant. Yep. Very good. So let me, let me give you another example, an exaggerated example of, of what I'm talking about here. It says, who are we to love? <coughs> who are we to give the gospel to? Each other. Everybody. And who are we to treat better than ourselves? Everybody. So one specific group I can think about is some people calling them our enemies, the Muslims. Show me in the Bible where it says that he does not want us to teach them the truth. Oh, definitely wants to. Okay, then, then show me in the Bible where he does not want us to pray for them. Definitely we should pray for them. Yeah. Okay, then show me where Jesus came for everybody except them. That's right. Everybody. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. We have deemed them enemies, mm -hmm. but we...
can't separate them. Now I'm going to bring it closer to home. What about the people that hurt us? What about the people that walk out on us? What about the people that steal from us? Pray for those that despitefully use you. Very good. Despitefully use you. I've got to remember that one. So, so many people have closed the doors to people that they don't like or even that they fear. They need Jesus more than anybody else. Amen. You know what I mean? And who has Jesus better? Us or plant and seed? There you go. See, I tell you, people, we in Christ have no fear of anyone or anything because we have Him, even if it costs us our lives. We are to take the message to them. You know, I have a prime example, and I'm not going to mention any names. You know, there's situations that I've been put in that I don't want to be around. It makes me sick. Mm -hmm. There's one today, and I just want to get out of there. Okay? The Holy Spirit is telling me to pray for her. The one who was the leader of the pack, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I did. And when I did, I got indicted inside. Mm -hmm. Because I prayed for somebody who um, the Holy Spirit came on her and she started, got a tear in her eye. And, and that's the power of our Father. I, mean, mm -hmm. I did not want to be there. I really didn't. But he used me anyway. Right. You know? yeah. Like your hat says, it Jesus hurts. heals, I'm just his tool. Amen. So you were his tool again today. Amen. But I didn't really, 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 really want to be there. And I don't want to be in the situation that I'm trying to help somebody and we want to do it and all that. But I'm not going to walk out 100% either. Right. Right. And that's hard to do. It is. So I, I said we, we have to do what he tells us to do. We can't. We can't fear anything. We can't. I'll even go one better, I, and I struggle with this one, the one that hurts us, like I said. We have to pray for them and not for their demise either. Mm -hmm. um, I mean that they find their way into truth in Christ. Not at all what my flesh wants, but I pray daily for guidance on these matters, and it always comes back to this. God sent Jesus for everyone. I was asking those questions. And we are to pray for anyone to find their way to Him. Not all will make it, but that's not for us to determine. Yes, sir. Many people say to the Lord's Prayer and don't realize they are cursing themselves. They ask God to forgive them, even or to the same extent that I forgive those who hurt me. Mm -hmm. Not more than that. Don't forgive me more than I'm forgiving these people. They don't realize what they're saying when they say that. Yep. All right, then. Verse 16. For who were these who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell? in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient. So we, oh, let me stop there, sorry, 18. No, 19. So we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. These people had seen the power of God and his miracles and how he rescued them through what he did to the Egyptians, yet they still rebelled against him in their unbelief that he would take care of them. And the people who disobeyed, or that generation, were not allowed to enter the promised land. Why? Because of that unbelief. They refused to trust God. They refused to listen and follow. The same thing could happen in the first century and the book of Hebrews implies just that. Yes, sir. 
Gene and I have a healing ministry, mm -hmm. and we go places to heal for people. And uh, many times before we are done praying, they're explaining to us why God won't do this. Mm -hmm. They're telling me what's going to happen. As soon as they're done mm -hmm. praying, my, my it's just coming back on me. By the time I get home, I'll have the same pain again. And they're right. But then there's the other ones who do believe that Jesus does heal. And they're healed. And they're healed. Miraculously. But sometimes it don't happen right when Jesus has his prayer for them. Okay? Yeah. So we just make But it's not your <clears throat> place to determine no, but whether or not it's whether it's my turn. Whether or not it's gonna happen is not for you to determine. Right. Oh, and it's not for them to determine, it's God's determination. Exactly, you're right. Okay. So they refuse to trust God. They refuse to listen and follow. Um, if people don't focus on Christ, then they drift away and begin uh, to trust in the other things instead of in Him. The same spirit with which Christians set out in the ways of God, they should maintain until the end. Perseverance in faith is the best evidence in this, of the sincerity of our faith. Hearing the words often is a means of salvation, yet it is, if it's not hearkened to, then it will expose more to the divine wrath. And we fall away when that happens. The happiness of being the partakers of Christ and His complete salvation and, and is the fear of God's wrath and eternal misery, and that should stir us to the perseverance of life of obedient faith. We know what we have because of Him. We should stay in that. Let us be aware or beware of trusting to outward privileges or professions and pray to be numbered with the true believers who do enter heaven. When all others fail because of unbelief, as our obedience follows according to the power of our faith, so our sins and want of care are according to the prevailing of unbelief in us. So, we know what's right. We have to trust in that and we have to keep going with that. Even if others tell us it's not right. That's what I got out of that. So, as you can see, the writer of Hebrews is starting to make that shift from who Christ is to what Christ did. What is important is that the writer then wants them to not fall away like the uh, Jews did in, in the desert after Egypt. Because that was a miserable time. And that entire generation failed to enter the promised land. Right. So the next generation coming up wouldn't have known all the things that had happened. Questions? Comments? Having fun? Mm -hmm. Good, I am. All right, then we're gonna go ahead and turn the camera off and do our um, prayer request. Of course, if you guys have any out there on the internet, just please send them to me. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks.